thank you uh, so this is uh, our we we've been doing a master classes under the leadership of dr abhishek cook because our ent colleagues here i need to mention this is the first time we you know we are doing under gulf allergy asthma and clinical immunology umbrella which is a newly formed organization uh, which probably dr abhishek cook will explain you uh, later as we go forward and uh, thank you all for attending the first master class in the gulf allergy asthma and clinical immunology uh, disclosures i have none significant to this lecture so the topic assigned to me is the uh, epidemiology or more emphasis on immunopathology which i'll go more in detail so rhinitis uh, this is from world allergy organization definition is a symptomatic disorder of nose characterized by itching nasal discharge sneezing and nasal airway obstruction so they didn't specify is it allergic rhinitis or non allergic rhinitis so the point i want to emphasize is there is histaminergic response even in non allergic rhinitis okay so either it's allergic rhinitis or non allergic rhinitis you can still have the itching at the nasal discharge yeah because we typically think non allergic rhinitis is non histaminergic so you see profound obstruction or rhinorrhea but you will be seeing sneezing and itching as well there are histamine and other mediators playing role and that's why world allergy organizations when they were calling this definition they were very careful to include that rhinitis is itching and nasal discharge and sneezing and nasal airway obstruction either it's allergic or non allergic of course we're going to divide it into allergic and non 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 allergic and uh, uh, so to ent experts you know i need not go in detail with non allergic because day to day you've been managing this so we manage allergic aspect so in terms of allergic rhinitis you know we look whether it's seasonal allergic rhinitis or perennial allergic rhinitis and is it intermittent or persistent more often it starts as intermittent and later on becomes persistent in the allergy spectrum so the common phenotypes we are going to see uh, in the real world setting are allergic rhinitis and uh, infectious rhinitis more often viral rhinitis in children and adults and uh, non infectious non allergic rhinitis and uh, nares non allergic rhinitis with eosinophilia syndrome very high amount of eosinophils on the nasal smear i guess these days we don't do nasal smears but if you do nasal smear and look under the microscope you're going to see more than 25 eosinophils per hyper field which is non allergic rhinitis with eosinophilia syndrome yeah and chronic rhinosinusitis with or without pollen in any rhinitis patient so these are the common phenotypes we're going to see in the real world so if you look at the data this is a national allergy advisory council data uh, what are the patients who have uh, you know we, we can't uh, in a clinical setting we can't say this is pure allergic rhinitis or pure non allergic rhinitis it's majority of the time it's going to be mixed you know if you see almost up to 50% you will see pure allergic rhinitis but other scenarios where you're going to see a mixed phenotype this is where the challenge comes in the mixed phenotype you go on to surgery what's going to happen and if underlying allergies are not addressed the turbulence will grow back again so uh, it is very important when you're doing assessment of any rhinitis patient first to see if there's any underlying allergic rhinitis so the two places where i trained and practice the are in the real world in the american setting i can say this because i was a president of the orange county allergy society we had around 100 allergists and we were working very closely with a 200 ent group the consensus was that when a patient comes with rhinitis it's important for us to assess if there is any underlying allergic etiology because majority of the times if you see and put the numbers together around 3 out of 4 patients you will see an allergic component is it predominant or is it minor it's hard to tell but there is a underlying allergic component so it is important to do an allergy assessment when seeing a patient with rhinitis so that's what they mentioned this is the national allergy advisory council data around 77% of the patients had an underlying allergic component so uh, by definition this is from aria is uh, induction of rhinitis symptoms after allergen exposure sensitization and specific ig mediated reaction and this is accompanied by the inflammation of the nasal mucosa and leads to nasal airway hyperreactivity often times we underestimate the effect of the nasal airway hyperreactivity you know we think of allergen induced hyperreactivity in the lungs and call it as asthma but we see similar response in the nasal airway mucosa as well so not only inflammation is there but nasal airway hyperreactivity response is also there so it is allergen induced specifically ig mediated inflammation 
in the mucosa plus nasal hyperreactivity. So John Bostock presented himself as the first case in the Medical and Surgical Society and coined the term in 1819. You know, since then we've been calling it as allergic rhinitis or cataras stems. Organ involvement, oftentimes there is again uh, from my GP colleagues, there is a misconception that allergic rhinitis involves only the nose, you know. And uh, I see patients referred from the GP or the family medicine to the ophthalmologist, to the ENT, uh, and then uh, at the specific ear experts within ENT, and then they are referred back to me, you know, uh, or to our, our colleagues, because they think allergic rhinitis means it involves only the nose, okay. So the organ systems involvement is quite extensive, you know, it can involve the nose, the eyes, eustachian tubes, which is one of the most difficult to treat, you know, rhinitis a complication, a middle ear, you will see a lot of otitis media, sinuses very commonly involved and pharynx. Um, the eyes, you know, is often seen as a different entity, but it is part of one disease, it is allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. There are some patients who have more manifestations in the eye than in the nose. So ophthalmologists, they start using the uh, anti-allergy eye drops, they, and then patient goes into remission and relapses, and the cycle keeps on going. And until the patient reaches complications, then they start okay, thinking, okay, is it allergic rhinitis? And there are not predominant nasal symptoms, and let me refer to the allergist. Or sometimes they present with isolated throat symptoms. And when you examine the nose, you'll see profound inflammation. Yeah. So it doesn't, if nasal symptoms are not there, it doesn't mean that they have underlying rhinitis, okay? It can be manifesting in a different organ system where mast cell density is very high. Then the question you should ask is, why this patient is not having nasal symptoms and throat symptoms and eye symptoms or ear symptoms? The mast cell density, again, in, in majority of the patients is more concentrated in the nose. But the mast cell density sometimes is very high in the eyes, okay, or in the throat in certain patients. And some uh, in scenarios, you'll see profound eustachian tube problems. But the rhinitis symptoms are not there. So this, we have to understand that it is the difference in the mast cell density and mast cell degranulation in that particular tissue. And it is all, again, one disease spectrum with various areas of involvement. So allergic rhinitis organ involvement can be anyway in the eyes, in the nose, in the ears, in the middle ear, eustachian tubes, sinuses, nasopharynx, sometimes oropharynx, and hypopharynx as well you see sometimes patients here. Epidemiology, uh, sorry for the slide from old data, but relatively much higher in number as we go forward. I'll explain the two other reasons, three reasons why the number is going up. So this is the general population data from 2000 census. The population prevalence uh, at that time was around 14.2. Uh, my bad, I should have updated the slide. So allergic rhinitis, you know, is seen in around 40% of the children annually and 20 to 30, 10 to 30% of the adults. However, as the years went on from 2000 to 2010 to 2020, the population prevalence went up. Why? Because of hygiene hypothesis. And then two is, what we realized is with the uh, raise in the temperature, which we are uh, you know, worried now, and uh, with the rise of the CO2, the incidence of the allergic rhinitis or TH2 inflammation is also going up. So it is not that the pollution is contributing only to the respiratory diseases. It's also, for some reasons, kind of enhancing the TH2 responses. So the population prevalence of allergic rhinitis over the last two decades has gone up and up, but not down. So more densely polluted cities, you're going to see more allergic rhinitis. So you usually expect non-allergic irritant responses, but you're going to see more allergic rhinitis in the cities. If you take the world stopped and densely polluted cities, you're going to see much higher number of allergic rhinitis cases. To the contrary of perception that, you know, this is more irritant induced response in upper airway and lower airway, you're going to see more TH2 response. Seasonal allergies, we are all familiar with pollen, you know, tree pollen, grass pollen, weed, ragweed, Pashantism, the famous weed pollen here, and outdoor mold spores. Perennial house dust mites, one of the most common reason for profound allergic rhinitis here, pet dander, indoor molds, cockroach in the inner cities. So if I have to pick an allergen which is playing a predominant role in the region, that would be the house dust mite allergen. 
And uh, to my surprise, you know, when we do the dustmite profiling, you know, we see DPDF, Euroglyph is many, which is a global dustmite. We are seeing more of DP and DF similar to Europe and North America. If you go more east towards the Asia, you see a lot of Euroglyph is many, which is the what is uh, global dust mite allergen. Whereas when it comes to Middle East, it's following the same pattern as Europe and North America. It is going to be uh, Dermatophagodus uh, terenosis or Faraday. So DP and DF are the most common one because sometimes I get a question from ENTs, you know, who are coming from the east and practicing here or who are sending patients like. Should we also include Euroglyphis many? But the data shows that DP and DF are the predominant allergens because sometimes you'll see in the panels, they ask you if you want to do the Euroglyphis many as well. It's not a dominant allergen in this region. But if you want to be inclusive, yes, you can do. The phenotypes, you know, seasonal allergic rhinitis, perennial allergic rhinitis, seasonal perennial. So it's very tough to differentiate uh, seasonal allergic rhinitis with you know, exacerbations frequently are perineal allergic rhinitis. Uh, perineal allergic rhinitis can sometimes have a differential presentation, okay? When the uh, indoor humidity level raises with house dust mite, you're going to see much worsening of the symptoms. So sometimes there can be a misperception that is it seasonality, that in the fall or the winter, the symptoms are more. But actually it is the indoor perineal allergic rhinitis with more exacerbation at the time of the year. So humidity, pressure, weather changes in the indoor are also going to play a role in the differential expression of the exacerbation of the rhinitis. That doesn't, you know, should deter you from kind of considering the perineal allergic rhinitis. So to, to keep the long story short, it is tough even for us to determine which is few seasonal or which is perineal allergic rhinitis unless until you do the allergen sensitivity test. Onset, again, uh, it's, it was a very interesting way to look at what is the natural history of allergic rhinitis. Aero allergen sensitization, how early it will start. It can start as early as six months to two years of age. Okay? So the uh, aero allergen sensitization, interestingly, if it starts early in the life, it's often, of course, to be perineal allergen, you know, more so dust mite allergen. But seasonal allergic rhinitis starts a little later, you know, two to seven years of age. You know, 80% of them will have onset of allergic rhinitis much earlier in the, uh, life, you know, before age of 20 years. Seasonal allergic rhinitis, you know, prevalence is much higher in children and adolescents, whereas perineal allergic rhinitis is much higher in adults. You know. uh, however, these are more definition terms, you know, but if you look in the real world, it's tough to differentiate unless until you do the allergen sensitivity test. What are the reasons for developing allergic rhinitis? Genetics, of course, hygiene hypothesis, which I'll go more in detail, higher socioeconomic strata. Yes, allergic rhinitis is a disease of affluence. You're not going to see much in the underdeveloped countries in the world. You're not going to see very high prevalence of allergic rhinitis in Africa or uh, some countries where you know they're underdeveloped or poor. Exposure to the allergens and uh, is modification of natural foods playing any role in allergen sensitivity. Genetic tendency, if you look at what is the risk of spontaneous development of allergic rhinitis when there is no family history at all, it is around 17%. So uh, family history plays a role, but without family history also, spontaneous onset of allergic rhinitis, that TH2 polarization, de novo in a patient is seen. What is the risk if one parent has allergic rhinitis? One third of the children will have allergic rhinitis. If both parents have allergic rhinitis, I mean, on the both parents are parental side, if there is any atopy, it means allergic rhinitis, asthma, atopic dermatitis, or food allergy, any of the four are present, half of the children will have allergic rhinitis. So the take home message from this slide is choose your partner wisely. If you're not choosing your partner wisely, then choose your allergist very wisely. Okay. Because if both parents side there is history of allergic rhinitis. Obviously, one out of two children are going to be our patients. And if this, if two sides we are having a, a genetic, uh, a, you know, predisposition, you will see very higher incidence of severe atopic dermatitis and later on atopic march into allergic rhinitis. So you've seen that happen. And these patients will manifest both parental history leading to, uh, you know, child developing allergic rhinitis much early in onset and much severe in progression as well. So hygiene hypothesis, so human uh, cellular immune system, this is quite familiar to my allergy colleagues, so this is for my ENT colleagues, is composed of naive 
thymic T cells. Okay, naturally, these naive T cells are predisposed to go into Th1 pathway and fight all your infections. Um, or they can, you know, they can in genetically predisposed individual, they can go into TH2 pathway and cause allergic diagnosis. However, how do we the dictate or direct the polarization or, or what is the natural mechanism? Naturally, when, when any child is born, there is a lot of bacterial endotoxin exposure in the outdoor environment. Like what was happening like 50 years or 100 years ago, children were playing outdoors. They were playing with the soil, they were playing with the nature, okay? So soil saprophytes, you know, if, if I want to uh, bring your attention, non-tuberculous non mycobacteria, okay? And so many other soil bacteria. So the endotoxin exposure will keep on driving the TH1 system and prevent shunting or polarization into TH2 system. So thus preventing the allergic diocese. As child is a born, and exposed to nature and living in the open outdoor environment, a lot of bacterial endotoxin exposure happens, non-infectious as well. It's not, it need not be an infection, okay? That will drive the immune system into Th1 pathway and prevent the development of Th2 pathway induced allergic diseases, that's why. However, when the, and, and this hypothesis has been looked into, those children were born and raised on the farms, uh, in the first year of life, they had a pet dog. So a lot of skin of the dog has bacteria, staph intermediates, which doesn't affect us or harm us in any way. So they were getting a lot of bacterial and toxin exposure. Or uh, breastfeeding, okay? Breast milk also has uh, some bacteria. Uh, probiotic is, of course, is controversial, so I'm not going to go into that. And recurrent infections in first few years of life. However, um, the recurrent infections, early use of neonates, hopefully there are a lot of studies in the atopic dermatitis literature which are showing that very early use of antibiotics in the, in the neonates and in fancy, you know, are actually increasing the risk of developing allergic diseases. So those who have high bacterial endotoxin exposure, just because they are raised in the farms or they have a pet dog or they are breastfed, um, they have less likely chance of going into TH2 pathway. There is no genetic predisposition. Higher socioeconomic status, you know, uh, and this is more closed indoor living and less bacterial endotoxin exposure, and uh, and that that's how it has been explained. It's more like a living in a bubble. Right? Exposure to allergens, but significant exposure to allergens, you know, um, in early of life of offspring who have genetic tendency will make them develop allergic diseases much earlier. Of course, they already have the genes which can predispose them into TH2 at their allergen exposure is much high. So they're, they're more likely to develop allergic rhinitis. Modification of natural foods. Uh, the reason I put this is we don't know whether genetically modified foods are natural foods which are modified with processing. We know, yes, they increase the risk of development of food allergy. Do they play a role in the allergic rhinitis? It's still not clear, okay? The yeah. example is dry roasting of the peanuts to hundreds of degrees will make them more antigenic. You know, uh, there are patients who have peanut-induced anaphylaxis, you know, in certain countries, but when they go to certain countries and they're eating the natural peanuts, they're not having any reaction. So this has been put up in depth, okay. What are the risk factors of, so we looked at the, the reasons why people develop allergic rhinitis, either genetic predisposition or hygiene hypothesis. So what are the risk factors in any child or adult? You know? Family history, yes, plays a big role. We saw spontaneous was 17%, but 35 and 50 in terms of the family history. And uh, before age six years, if the serum Ig is more than 100, they're also at higher risk. Of course, higher socioeconomic strata again comes here and allergen sensitization very early in the life. Yeah, I'm talking about sensitization, not manifestation of the disease. So, genetic tendency, I think we looked into this already. Okay, so pathophysiology, as I mentioned in the hygiene hypothesis, the naive T cell, you know, the normal polarization is into TH2. Okay, but if either genetic predisposition or hygiene hypothesis or risk factors are present. And it also goes into TH2 pathway. So this IL-4 is an autoprene cytokine. So the IL-4 keeps on making that naive T cell produce more and more TH2. And this will release IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, IL-9, IL and all this. And they will be responsible for the allergic diet system stream. 
So pathophysiology, the first and foremost, uh, you know, phase one is sensitization. So how exactly sensitization happens in a, in a, in a predisposed individual or a susceptible individual? It is the interplay of genes and the barrier disruption, which we know from atopic dermatitis and asthma literature. And three, the environment. So it is the interplay of three factors, genetics, barrier dysfunction to a certain extent, and environment. All three will cause the allergen going in and presenting to the antigen presenting cells and then making specific antibodies and having memory of it, okay? So keep on repeating production of IgE. So the phase two is a clinical disease where the mast cell is already having pre-existing specific IgE. Let's say this is how is the smite uh, IgE. And when the allergen exposure happens, the house dust mite allergen inhalation happens and it's going through the nasal mucosa. Then the activation happens, which leads to three things. You know, the hyper-responsiveness, as I mentioned, early phase, late phase, hyper-responsiveness and priming, which I'll go in detail. Pathophysiology, I think I can explain this better. So it is an interplay of barrier dysfunction, genetics and the environmental factors as well. Please don't think that it's only allergens. The localized environmental factors will also play a role. Okay. Smoke, which is not an allergen. Other environmental factors, you know, weather change, humidity, pressure, uh, other irritants as well, viruses, infections. So, barrier dysfunction, environment, genes. This will all enhance the epithelium to produce few things TSLP. Okay. And that will cause the allergen to be taken up, you know, TSLP, IL-25, IL-30. Okay. So what will this do? This will help the allergen permeation to be taken up and presented to the naive T-cell to become TH2 and the downstream cytokine set to be well. So class switching happens in the B-cell and specific IgE to the house dust mite allergen is produced. So there is a memory pool of specific TH2 and IgE cells and allergic antibodies are there. They're already sensitized. And re-exposure causes release of mediators, which lead to the downstream symptoms. So there can be histaminergic symptoms, leukotriene mediated symptoms. There can be recruitment of cells. Okay, all these will be there. Okay, and the, the histamine and the leukotriene mediators have effects on the various specific entities mentioned here. And this is how you are going to leave, see the symptoms. You are seeing this, but the background is all this. Okay. You're seeing sneezing, runny nose, itching, nasal congestion, you know, and uh, but what exactly is happening is the mediators are doing this, the cells which are getting recruited are doing this. So all these will lead to the symptoms. Keep it easy. So the patient is already sensitized and made specific IG. The specific IG, the allergen binding, endothelial activation, you could try in addition and diapenesis, isnophil and basophil infiltration, and mediator release and direct immediate release as well. It causes immediate reaction. And this is the recruitment phase leading to late phase response. The same patient with the same allergen. And it is, let's say, for example, time X is when the immediate histaminergic symptoms happen within one hour. In the same patient, in a delayed fashion, within time Y, you're going to see the late phase response. So what are the predominant mediators which are going to play a role? Histamine, okay. And uh, there are prostaglandins as well, BGT2, leukotriene CDE4, and leukotriene B4. And uh, the activation of the nodes, the glands in IL-13 plays predominant role in mucus and uh, vasodilatation and other things because of the tissue infiltration. So mast cell histamine, where does it act? On the H1 receptor, okay? And uh, what does histamine do? The nociceptor nose axonal response will be there that leads to the itching, the sneezing, and the allergic circuit and the parasympathetic refluxes and granular excitosis. And this is more IL-13 induced because secretion and this also plays role. Right? Okay. And then histamine gets degraded. That's why the symptoms can be transient or short-lived. Or when the late phase response comes, they become more chronic and persistent. I think this is easy. Nasal allergic response, allergen. So this is a mass cell in the nose already is sensitized with the specific gene, the binding. Immediate early phase response, which is histaminergic, okay, sneezing, bronchitis, rhinorrhea, some obstruction of the symptoms. And then there is 
uh, leukocyte recruitment for the and also the prostaglandins and leukocytes being released. Late phase response can again be rhinorrhea obstruction, nasal hyperresponsiveness due to the priming response and to the other irritants. Okay, so you're seeing IL4, IL13, the other downstream effects. So there is an early phase response and a late phase response. And uh, what about the sneezing? You know what exactly happens? So. As the, this is slow conducting type C nerve fiber, okay, and this is getting activated because of histamine and other mediators, and uh, that will release substance B and the CGRP and other things. This is neurocrine receptor and this is muscarinic receptor, and that leads to the secretions, leak, dilatation, and symptoms. Yeah. So you are seeing three things happening. There is a neurological response, there is a cellular response, and there is mass cell mediator mediator. So three things are happening at the same time in the same patient. That way, even though allergic rhinitis looks very simple, you know, there are multiple mechanisms active in the same patient at one instance. There is a histamine-driven response. There is a histamine and other mediators also. And there is a neurological response. And there is cellular inflammation because of histophils and other cells, macrophages coming there. So the three things happening in the same patient at one instance. In the early phase, you'll see histamine and neurological, but in the last phase, you'll see the cellular responses as well. I think we already discussed this, you know, and this is the sneezing and the, again, we usually in the other tissues, we see IL-13 induced, whereas here you see in the mucus production also because of the efferent refluxes, so the causing sneezing and obstruction and mucus production. So this is really making Easy, normal, rapid phase, which is predominantly histamine and neurological, and late phase, blockade, mucus secretions, prostaglandin, mucotriols, neutrophils are more nasty cells to come here. And subacute or chronic phase, histophils play a predominant role. If you're doing any biopsies in the tissue, you want to see histophil predominance, I think. Yeah. And as it involves a sinus mucosa, then you'll see more of the symptoms. If there is a problem, you know, diminishment, diminishment of smell, taste, and all those things. Allergy priming is a very interesting thing. You know, uh, the place where I try, and uh, one of the fellows was looking into allergen priming response. So, allergen priming is if X amount of antigen, uh, National Juvenile Hospital in Denver, they did these studies, they call it as a nasal chapter. So, they do exposure and then they, they look at the mediators and response. If X amount of allergen induces, specific symptoms. In the priming, you require less and less allergen. Let's say 10 PNUs of dust mite allergen exposure is required in a sensitized individual to cause symptoms. As the priming happens after the late phase, what exactly I mean by priming is the mucosa is sensitized that it requires five or two or even one PNU of allergen to cause same symptoms or more severe symptoms. Okay. So this is a priming response. So what will happen if allergic rhinitis is not properly treated and just managed as a surgical disease? The mucosa will be primed, okay? And it will have more aggressive, severe response and less and less allergen will cause more severe response. The second thing is, oftentimes what you see in chronic rhinitis sinusitis with polyps, you always ask, did you lose smell, did you lose smell? In the rhinitis patients, those who are primed have heightened sense of smell. If someone's smoking a cigarette there, it starts sneezing here. Because the nasal mucosa is so primed, even the irritants will cause quite severe symptoms with less and less dose of exposure. So this is one of the major challenge in allergic rhinitis management. So less allergen with subsequent exposure causes more profound severe symptoms and profound inflammation as well. So that's why it is important to address the rhinitis. So influx of inflammatory cells and uh, that leads to priming where repeated allergen exposure, the amount of allergen required to induce symptom is much less. And also other thing is, so in, in, in allergen priming, three things will happen. Less allergen, more severe response. And heightened response to irritants. Third thing is they are more prone for sensitization. But there's a slight difference in pattern in what we see in North America and Europe here. Their patients are polysensitized. It's very, very rare. You know, with the microscope, you have to see who's monosensitized. We see a lot of the times because of the profound priming response, 
then they are polysensitized. They are not only sensitized to house dust mitologin, but to many things. For some interesting reasons, which I don't know, Dr. some of us have to explain this, that we see more more sensitized individuals in this region compared to the rest. Okay, so this allergen priming increases the risk of newer sensitization and predisposition also to irritated new symptoms. Clinical features I did not explain to the group. They are Ig mediated, rhinorrhea, blockage, itching, sneezing, post nasal rib, and I guess we are all familiar with multi-system involvement as we saw. Nose, eyes, sinuses, ear, eustachian tube, throat, pharynx. And uh, this is common stoning, allergy solute in a child. And this is allergic shiners in the bright red right eyes. Okay. And this is typically adenoid feces by age six, you know. Comorbidities, of course, it's very important. Disease, but an untreated allergic rhinitis is what's going to happen. Here, middle year, you know, the eustachian tube disease is very, very tough to treat. A lot of my empty colleagues, and not at his media, and rhinosinusitis, nasal polyposis, upper respiratory. However, so one airway, one disease, you know. So they are going to later on develop sensitization in the lower airway as well and progress into asthma, okay, as part of the atopic march. Comorbidities 67% may develop chronic sinusitis, 21 the number is low here, but it's not more higher as well. It is medium with infusion and 2% with recurrent nasal sand or polyposis. However, if you look in the sinusitis patients, a lot of them will progress into polyposis. Complications. See, allergic rhinitis is a lifestyle disease. Of course, you saw the multi-organ involvement and other complications, but in terms of quality of life, it is one of the diseases where quality of life is severely affected or in fact devastated. Sleep in children, you know, this is one of the major issues. Their quality, their sleep quality is very poor. Okay. And that's why their daytime concentration in the school goes down. Their learning abilities go down as well. This has been well demonstrated. And because of the adenoid, you know, dentofacial abnormalities. Sinusitis with polyposis or without asthma or it is media. Okay. Disordered breathing, again, a big issue in adults as well and sleep disturbance. So, what will happen with this? I'm going to emphasize on this. What will happen with this? If some patient has allergic rhinitis, sleep quality is affected, his breathing is impaired. What will happen? Daytime, when they wake up, they don't feel fresh. Why do we sleep? We sleep to rest our mind and body. But the next day morning, you wake up as if the same as. You are before you sleep, you know, you are devastated. So, daytime, you know, the they start having the effects in terms of fatigue, inability to focus and concentrate, increased irritability, okay, and feeling asleep by afternoon, profound fatigue by the end of the day, they don't feel like doing anything. So, it has severe impairment. Of course, we see the other aspects, but the significant thing, not only in children and adults, is this. Okay, so you treat allergic rhinitis, you're going to improve the quality of life. Complications, as we saw, you know, strong association with conjunctivitis. If you want the data, one out of four allergic rhinitis patients will have other system involvements. Perennial allergic rhinitis is an independent risk factor for development of asthma, one in one disease. And allergic rhinitis is a major risk factor for developing of rhinosinusitis, or it is really asthma. Classification, I think we are all familiar with RA guidelines less than four weeks, less than four days of a week, intermittent or more than four days persistent. More often it starts with this in allergic rhinitis. It is by default is going to progress into persistent. There is no allergic rhinitis which won't stay intermittent. You know, it's a chronic disease, progressive. We saw that cellular infiltrate will happen. So the disease and the inflammation will lead to progression. Mild symptoms, there is moderate to severe. Most of the phenotype you see in the real world, those who have allergic rhinitis for a long time is. Persistent with moderate to severe symptoms. Impact, yeah. productivity goes down, treatment burden is high, comorbidities are there. And we saw, you see, this is very, very important in adults. What we see is daytime, they have more fatigue, okay? And uh, because of the sleep disturbance, you know, uh, in the children, you know, you see their inability to concentrate at school, okay? Missing school and work, halitosis, bad breath, the daily productivity goes down in adults. And this is a very big complaint from the parents, you know, in bed studying, sniffing, snorting, blowing the nose, the social interaction and emotional well being. Okay? So, quality of life is significantly affected with allergic rhinitis. Differential diagnosis, you know, these are 
mucociliary defects, cystic fibrosis, and other mucociliary defects, CSF, pyloria, many experts know how to manage this. Anatomical abnormalities, sometimes it can be mixed rhinitis, foreign bodies, tumors, granulomas, oftentimes under lupus, sarcoid granuloma, and vaginus, but they'll have sinus and lung involvement. So if you look, you'll find the symptoms are, if you do radiological imaging, you may find this. Yeah. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. <laughs>